You know, we, we've been blessed in recent weeks by lots of things. Some of the blessings have come in response to the disasters and the hurricanes. And we've got a whole row full of blessings sitting right back here. These guys, can, how far did y'all drive to get here today, brother? See, they didn't come just to hear me preach. Now, I'm not going to get the big hit. To stand up a minute. Go, please, all of you stand up and, and tell them who you are, why you're here, and tell us what's going on. Amen. Brother, you didn't, he wouldn't tell us your name. Oh, well, so this is, go ahead, go ahead. My name is Justin Vaughn. I'm also from Houston. Uh, I came here with Jason and his wife. But uh, like you said, this is our second trip here. And it's just been a blessing to work in God's community. And, um, you know, going to see you guys, uh, see the devastation y'all been through, to be able to help and lend a hand is, is truly a blessing to us. So we appreciate you guys housing us back there in the portables. Like Jason was saying, you know, the first time we came, didn't know there was going to be electricity or water, and we showed up, and there was water, and we had generators, and it was just far beyond what we thought it was going to be. So thank you so much for allowing us to come into your town and, and help you guys rebuild. Amen. Amen. We thank God for you. We really do. And, and, and they didn't come here for any praise at all. They came to serve the Lord Jesus and to share his love in a very real and practical way. Some of you have roof tarps on your roof because of these guys and others like them that have been coming and they're all interconnected. And We've been blessed to be able to house them, give them a place to sleep, a place to take a shower, and have some food and rest. And I can tell you from being around them, they're special folks. They really are. We're glad y'all are here. I've got good news. I don't... We didn't have a hurricane this last week. <laughs> it would been a whole week, over a week. It hadn't been nice. I mean, we didn't have to come here and say, well, how bad the storm gets your house tomorrow, or yesterday, rather. But we've been through a lot. I mean, the pandemic, two hurricanes, and now the elections that are coming up right at, in just a couple of weeks. We need the Lord, folks. I mean, we always need the Lord, but I mean, right now we're very acutely aware of how much we need God in our lives. And I, I just believe God wants to share with you today how to come into the presence of God and experience not only His presence, but His power at a time when we so desperately need it. And we need it more than we realize. Sometimes we just sit in a corner and panic. <laughs> when we ought to be focused on the Lord and say, Lord, I need you. Let's talk. <laughs> so I hope you open your Bibles now to Hebrews chapter 10 because in the verses 19 through 25, we're, we're going to be finding that God tells us step by step how to come to Him, how to experience Him, and how to experience the blessings that He has for us at times like these. I mean, I've never read it in this fashion before, but it's just a step-by-step -step process. And we're going to begin reading in verse 19. So let's read it together. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which He hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, His flesh. In order to understand that verse of Scripture, you need to know your Old Testament a little bit. You need to understand about the Jewish way of worshiping God established that centuries and centuries ago when He told them to design the tabernacle out there in the wilderness when they were coming out of Egypt. And He said, in the tabernacle, you're to create a place called the Holy of Holies, a very special, sacred place. He said, I will reside there. I will make my presence uniquely there in the Holy of Holies. In the Holy of Holies, you put the ark of the 
tab uh, Ark of the Covenant in, inside that tabernacle. And in the Ark of the Covenant, you're going to have the Ten Commandments. You're going to have Aaron's rod that budded in. You're going to have a, a bowl of manna to remind you that I provided for you in the wilderness. And in the covering the lid on this big box, gold box that they called the Ark of the Covenant, that was called the mercy seat. And that mercy seat was a very special place because one time a year, the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies. He was the only one that could go in there. Of all the millions of Jews there were, none of the rest of them could go into the Holy of Holies, into that special room. But the high priest could one day a year and to offer sacrifice for the sins of his people. And what he would do is he would take the blood of an unblemished lamb representing Jesus, his blood, and he would sprinkle it onto the top of that seat asking God to forgive the people of their sins. This is the holy place. This is what he was referring to here. Boldness to enter into the holiest. The holiest place on planet earth was right there because God was uniquely there. God could be any place he wanted to be and be in many places at one time. That's not a problem. But God said, I'm going to establish my presence there. And he did. And so this is what the writer of Hebrews was talking about. And you notice he used the word brethren. He was writing only to Christian people. When you see that word in your Bible, know that it is written to Christian people. People who have trusted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. People who have all their sins forgiven. People who have been born again. Who have a new life in Christ and are on their way to heaven. So he's saying in that verse of Scripture, Brethren, Christians, my brothers and sisters in Christ, you're having a boldness to enter into the holiness just like the high priest used to do. It not only was in the tabernacle, but later on when the temple was built, it was exactly the same thing. You can enter into the holiest and you come in by the blood of Jesus. And in verse 20, he said, By a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. There was a veil or a curtain over the front of the Holy of Holies. Tremendous curtain that kept people out to make sure that nobody got in. They couldn't even see in there. And if you see this closely, it says, He has created a new living way to get through the veil to get into the presence of God. His flesh. The old way... It was only for the high priest. And the high priest could only go in there once a year to offer the sacrifice for his people. But he's, there's a new and living way for us, brethren, for those who've been saved, brethren. He said, there's a way for you to get to the Holy of Holies, for you to get into the very presence of Almighty, Eternal Creator, Holy God. You have a way through the veil. And it's his flesh. Whose flesh? Jesus' flesh. You can come into the presence of God by the blood of Jesus and through the flesh. A lot of people want to come into the presence of God. A lot of people want to come to God. They say, I don't like the way that they say in the Bible. I don't want to come by Jesus. I've got some other way in mind. I think I'll just join a church. That'll do it. No, it won't. I think I'll just do a whole bunch of good stuff. I'll cut down trees. I'll tarp roofs. That'll make God impressed enough. Get me into heaven. No, it won't. That's not going to, I'm sorry, there's a veil, and the veil is Jesus, and He is not only keeping you out, but He is the one who makes the entrance to the presence of God. Yeah, is. There is no other way. So if you're thinking there's some other way for you, you're mistaken. Say, well, I don't know, I was taught all these rules and regulations, I kept the Ten Commandments, I'd get it into heaven, I don't need to worry about Jesus and the veil. You, how many of those Ten Commandments have you kept? How about having no other gods before me? Was there ever time in your life that God was not supreme in your life? Was there ever time you took his name in vain? Or was there ever a time that you failed to keep the Sabbath or honor your father and mother? Have I said enough? No, keeping the Ten Commandments surely doesn't work. There is no other way. How do you know that? Because Jesus said so. He said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. Nobody can get beyond the veil except by me. Right. 
He said, I am the veil and I am the one who allows you to go through to the Father. So how do you get to the Father? Through the veil. How do you get through the veil? That's Jesus. You've got to come to Him and say, Jesus, absorb me. Accept me. I want you to receive me as I receive you. And Jesus says, I'll do that when you repent of your sins and trust me as your Savior. Instantly, you're into the presence of Holy God. Amen. Instantly. There is no barrier between a born-again believer and Holy God. It's removed. Amen. Brethren, that's who He's talking to. He's talking to us. He says, we are having a high priest over the house of God. You know, under the old system, before Jesus, they had a new high priest every year. I mean, it's kind of like they used him up and wore him out when he came in on the day of Yom Kippur, when they would have the uh, event where he would go into the Holy of Holies. But they would get a new high priest after that every year. Well, we have a new high priest. We, we, we've got a, a new high priest, and he is eternally our high priest. He doesn't get replaced. And he doesn't have to go out and kill another lamb and sprinkle blood of a new unblemished lamb onto the mercy seat. No, no. Jesus sprinkled his blood one time. And he's eternally our high priest. We don't have to search for another one and hope he's good enough, to, better than the last one they had last year as high priest. Because if you know anything about your Bible history, some of those old high priests were really corrupt. Even though they did their job. No, no. We, we have a high priest over the house of God. We brethren. And he does not need to be replaced. He poured out his own blood as an offering for our sins once forever. It needs not be repeated and it cannot be duplicated. He'll never do it again. Never. Doesn't need to. Why? Because he did it completely, perfectly, eternally. And he has offered his own precious blood for our sins. Those Old Testament priests, they, they were a foreshadowing of what Jesus would do. Jesus poured out His blood on Calvary's cross, but then if I understand the Scriptures, He took His blood to heaven when He ascended to heaven, and He took it up there to heaven, to an altar in heaven, and said, Father, here's my blood for the sins of the people, for the sins of all the world. Cannot improve on that, can you? And no, there is no other way. Look at verse 22. He says, Let us draw near Art, you want to get close to God? You want Him close in your life right now? Would you like to have know that God's right there when you face that adjuster with the insurance company? You want to know God's right there with you when you deal with the contractor, when you deal with whatever else you're... Let's draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Very unusual scripture. First, we come to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've never trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are not in the Holy of Holies. You're, you're not in the holiest place. You're not in the presence of God. So you need to start there this morning, okay? But if you're already there, he says, now you want to draw near. Draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. We need the Lord today. There's no doubt about that. We, we need His wisdom. We, we, we need His comfort. We need His encouragement. Because we're going through some tough times. But So let's draw near to Him today. Let's come close to Him. And, and not try to draw close to Him through some superficial actions or rituals or memorized prayers that have long lost their meaning. But with true hearts. Really mean it. Oh God, I need you. God, I, I need you so much, I'm willing to surrender it all to you. I, I need you. That's a true heart. Not God, show me your plan. If I like it, I'll do it. That's not a true heart. No, come to Him with true hearts. And it says, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. That phrase, that that that. That puzzled me for a while, an evil conscience. How can you have an evil conscience? I thought the con our conscience was supposed to be the thing that told us what to do right and not to do wrong. 
right? But an evil conscience. He said, having your hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Hmm. I, I, I pondered that for a while. Prayed about it. I said, God, you got to show me what this means. How can you have an evil conscience? Here's what the Lord showed me. An evil conscience is a conscience that reminds a born-again believer who's been washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, who's had every sin taken away of their old sins that you committed before you got saved and making you feel guilty all over again. That's an evil conscience. That's not a conscience that's there for your good. It's evil. It's there to hurt you. That, that type of reminder doesn't come from heaven. That reminder comes from hell. Listen, I, I can prove it to you. Back, back up. Because you see, that conscience is trying to remind of Christians of their past sins and what we used to be before we got saved. But we're not now. That's not us anymore. It used to define us. It doesn't define us now. Maybe you were an addict, a drug addict. Maybe you were this. Maybe you were that. And you were a wicked, evil person back then. But you got saved and bingo, you were born again. God took that away from you. He cleaned you up and He's maybe still cleaning you up. But you're not the person you used to be. If you're saved, that's an absolute fact. We've been born again. We're not the same people we used to be. Old things have passed away. All things are becoming new. We're a new creation in Christ Jesus. So we can look back and say, well, that's, that was how I was, but it's not me now. But the devil's saying, yeah, but you know, you're still feeling pretty guilty about that. Uh-uh. Here's why I say uh-uh. Back up to verse 17. Here's what God says about that. Their sins and iniquities will I remember. How long? No more. Honey, if God forgot it, what in the world are you doing remembering it? Don't, don't let the devil remind you of something God has already forgotten. God's forgiveness is complete. It's not partial. It's total. Sure, we were all sinners before we got saved. And yeah, we're still sinners, but we're being forgiven. So an evil conscience is that voice that says, yeah, but you know, you were so bad back then. Let me remind you of all that bad stuff you did. I want you to feel guilty all over again. Why in the world would the devil want you to feel guilty all over again? Because it'll put the brakes on you serving Jesus. It'll take away your joy because God has erased the slate. He has erased the sin list and you don't need to be looking at it anymore because it's depressing. Some of us can look at our lives before we got saved and that is, I'm so depressed. I, I hate the fact I was like that. I don't even want to think about it. The devil says, I want you to think about it a while. Because see, you're not having your joy in Jesus when you're thinking about that. I've got a dear friend. And I don't know, I probably introduced him to you before, but that's okay. I'm old enough to say he's just getting old. He's repeating himself. This, this guy... Before he was saved, I'm trying to say the nicest way I can, he carried a gun for the syndicate, okay? Does that, does that ring a bell with anybody? He was a certified, genuine bad guy. He really was. And he would, he became a preacher after he got saved, and he would tell his testimony of what he used to be and what he was now. And he said he had a preacher come to him and tell him one. He said, Bob, you better quit that. He said, What? He said, you're glorifying what you used to be. You need to focus more on what you are now. Amen. Talk about Jesus. It's okay to say he's delivered me from that, but minimize what you used to be because that's not who you are anymore. Some of us need to take that advice. He said, our hearts are being sprinkled. <laughs> that, that got me too. Our hearts are being sprinkled from an evil conscience. Well, why, do you, what, what, why in the world would you sprinkle an evil conscience? It's interesting, that particular word, the same word that is used in regards to the sprinkling of the blood on the mercy seat. Oh, now it makes sense. Because when the blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle by the high priest, God accepted that to remove the sins of the people. And so if that old evil conscience has got some memories in it of what we used to be and how sinful we used to be, that blood gets sprinkled and it's gone. It's forgiven. 
That's the only explanation I can come up with how, what it means to be sprinkled from an evil conscience. And then what about our bodies washed with pure water? In order to understand that part of it, you've got to make sure you get the whole verse. He says, having, that's an ongoing process, our heart sprinkled from an evil conscience. In other words, every time it comes up again, it, it can be washed away. And our bodies, again, having our bodies washed with pure water, is not a one-time washing. This is not talking about water baptism at all. This is talking about a continual thing of being washed with pure water. Hi. Well, most water, as you've probably noticed, isn't pure. Have, have you had the ban lifted on drinking water in your area? We, we've all been through water that's not so pure, and even all the bottled water we've got, some of it doesn't taste all that great. So we're wondering, what is really pure water? The, the Bible talks about pure water. In the book of Ephesians chapter 5, it talks about the Lord Jesus washing us with the water of His Word. That's what happens to Christian people. When Christian people who've been born again study God's Word, He washes us. This book will clean up your life if you'll let it. Amen. Washes us. You say, what do you mean? It's talking about washing my body. Yeah, I'm going to tell you something. But what washes my brain and washes my heart affects how what my body does. Yours too. It determines where we go. It, de it determines what we do with this physical body. So yes, the body does get washed with the water of the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. God's holy word, your Bible. I suggest a regular shower. As often as you can get it. Oh my. Christian, we need just to remember. Brethren, we have been saved and we are being washed. And the more we get washed, the closer to God we get. And the closer to God we get, the more we want to be washed. And we can come close to God in times like these. Even if we're not as clean as we know we ought to be, we can come close to God because He wants us there and He's going to help us get there. He loves us and He knows we need Him. Move down to verse 23. He said, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. We've already said we've trusted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We're trusting Him as God in the flesh. Our faith is in Him. For He is faithful that promised. When tough times make you doubt, remember something. God is faithful. Get, 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 your, get your eyes off of your troubles and the things that are making you doubt and just look to Him. He is faithful to His Word. Whatever He has promised, He will do. He will do it. He may not do it in, on your schedule, but He will do it on His schedule. And His schedule is perfect and yours probably isn't. Jesus said, if any man will come to me, I will in no wise cast him out. Trust Him. Be fa He's faithful to that. He means it. He tells us in the 14th chapter of John. You believe in God? Believe also in me. He said, in my Father's house are many mansions, and I go to prepare a place for you. That's pretty plain. And he says, if I go and prepare a place for you, and that if means, if means since I'm going, I will come again, and I'll receive you unto myself, so that where I am there you may be also. Believe him. Believe him. If you're worried about the condition of your house, like I just found out mine's full of termites, it's a temporary house. Uh, we're going to fix it up and keep it as long as the Lord leaves us here, but we've got a better place. He's already told us that. Believe his promises. Whatever he's promised, he will do. He has promised he would never leave us or forsake us. Believe him. He's not going to leave us and he's not going to forsake us. He's promised that when we cry out to Him, He will hear our cries. He will listen to us. He won't say, I'm sorry, I was busy. What did you say? No, no. He won't say, you didn't say it loud enough or long enough. No, no. He will hear our cries when we cry out to Him in prayer. And He will answer our prayers when we pray. He will bless us. He will show us His love. And He'll show us 
His mercy. He'll show us His grace. And yes, He'll show us His wisdom. And yes, He will show us His power. He has promised, I love you. Ask, and it'll be given to you. Seek, and you'll find it. Knock, the door will be open to you. Come on, he said, you just got to come to me and trust me. He also promised, I will work all things together for good for those that love God and are called unto his purpose. Did you get that? God's going to work all of this together for your good and my good. And in the long run, eventually, if we love Him and are we among those who have been called according to His purpose. In other words, we've heard God's call in our life. We've come to Him and trusted Him. And He said, I'm going to work it out for your good. You may not like it when I'm working. You may not like how rough it's going to be. You may not like how hot the fire is going to be at the time. But in, before it's all over, you're going to say, wow, thank you, Lord. I can give you the example. I just mentioned to you about the termites. Hurricane Delta came along and came back to my house. And I said, wow, look, the only bad thing that happened was there was a TV antenna. It was one of those three-legged towers, and it was attached to the eave of my house. And that thing was in that house when we bought the house nearly 30 years ago. So, I mean, I don't know when it was up, but it had been there a long time, but lots of storms. But this time, it ripped it off, and it was laying on the neighbor's fence. And I said, oh, that's not so bad. And then we looked up there at the... Wood and uh oh, looked like it might have been rotten. That's why it came off. So we started tearing gutters off the house, <laughs> and then we tore the vinyl off. And there's termites. Now, I can't really, with all sincerity, thank God for Hurricane Delta. I can't really sincerely ask him for laying on the tower on the fence, but I'm sure glad he showed me those termites. Because we, we, we've got an exterminator in our church. Okay? If that had not happened that looked so terrible, we wouldn't know those darlings are there eating our house. But now we can put a stop to it. He works all things together for good for those that love Him and are called according to His purpose. And I'm not any different from you. You're going to find some stuff that you're not going to like, but eventually you're going to say, Thank you, Lord. I hate those termites, but I'm glad you showed them to me. I hate what happened, but I'm glad you showed it to me. Now, looking back on it, it's okay. Thank you. You are true to your word. I'm holding fast to your promise. I'm just trusting you. Verse 24. And he said, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Look where we started. We started outside the veil with the Lord Jesus Christ to come to the presence of Almighty God and Jesus as our high priest. And we can draw close to Him with full assurance, trusting Him as He's cleansing us. And we're hanging on to the promises of God. And now, He says, consider somebody else. Some of us have been so focused on our troubles and our trials, we haven't been able to consider other people than, other than when they walk up to you and tell you their troubles. And you really say, I've heard enough. <laughs> Your story's like somebody else's. I've heard it a hundred times before, and it's hard for me to have sympathy for you because I'm so focused on my troubles. That's not what he says. Let us consider one another. Pay attention to each other. Consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Sometimes, in order to experience God's presence and His power, we have to shift our focus away from us to somebody else. Somebody else whose troubles are worse than ours. You may say, well, I don't know. Their troubles aren't worse than mine. Here's something we learned years and years ago. A person's biggest problem or their greatest trouble is their biggest problem or their greatest trouble, no matter how it compares to yours. That's what they're struggling with. That's what's got them beaten down. That's what's causing them to lose sleep at night. It may not compare to yours, but it doesn't have to in order to be their biggest problem. So we need to consider one another, take our eyes off ourselves, focus on them. And then what do we do? To provoke and to love and to good works. Find ways to show them God's love. Don't, don't just say, oh, that's too bad. No, 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 we're, we're to show them God's love. And do good works for them. Come put a tarp on the roof if you can. Come, come bake them something to eat, a cookie or anything. 
Do something good for them. They need something good in their lives right now because everything's bad. They need something good. The guy that says, my wife just came down with COVID. She's in the hospital. He needs something good. Oh, he's got a lot of people saying, I'm praying for you and for your wife. And that is good. But somebody comes and does something positive for him, that's even better. Say, look, brother, I, I, I know this cookie I baked for you or cake or whatever it is. It's, it's not much, but I just wanted to have you have something good in your life today. Do something good. Sometimes we just need to put an arm about somebody's shoulders and weep with them. And sometimes we need to just say, look, I want to pray for you, and I'm not going to pray for you tonight. I'm going to pray for you right now. Let them listen to you pray. It means something when somebody says, I'll pray for you, brother. But if somebody says, let's pray right now, and you actually hear them pray, a thousand times better. Oh, it doesn't mean God hears you any better, but the person that's listening to somebody else pray, oh, yeah. It means a lot. Sometimes it means more than that. Sometimes it means get, reaching down and giving them a hand, picking them up, because they've been knocked down. They've been knocked down hard. Pick them up. Do what you can. Lift them up. And when you do that, it, witness to them. Tell them about the love of God. Go right ahead. Are you, what are they going to do? Get mad at you? Go ahead and tell you, yeah, I know it's tough, but God still loves you. He still loves you, and, and He did sac still sacrifice His Son on Calvary's cross for you. In spite of what you're going through now, it's still true that your sins can be forgiven. You can spend forever with God in heaven. It's still true. Encourage them to look beyond the moment. Lift them up. Encourage them to trust Jesus as their Savior and as their Lord. That, that very moment, that might be that divine appointment that God has set for that person to be saved. So Christian, guess what? Brothers, <laughs> we got a job to do, don't we? Looking at others, considering them and helping them, provoking them to the love and to good works. Now, how do we go about doing that? How, I mean, how, what's a practical way? I mean, if we decided, okay, that's what we're going to do because that's going to bring us closer to God and we're going to experience His power and His presence more. This is going to help us do that. How do we go about focusing on one another and just ourselves. How, how do we do that? Well, the next verse tells us. This is so neat how God laid this all out. Look at verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together is a matter of some is but exhorting one another. Wow. What do you do? If you really want to consider other people and you really want to help other people and you want to be blessed in the process, Go to church. <laughs> yeah, I mean it. Just come to church and encourage one another. That's what exhorting means. God designed us as people to interact with people. Hey, have you ever noticed God blesses His people through His people? He blesses His children through His children? He does. Some of you can say, oh yeah, I've experienced that. I've been the one on the receiving end. I've been the one on giving end. But yeah, that's absolutely true. We need to gather together and we need to do it as often as we can in order to encourage one another. Be reminded of Jesus. Be reminded of the cross. Be reminded of the empty tomb. Be reminded of the power and love of Almighty God. That's what we do when we come to church. When, let me ask you this. When, when you came this morning to church, did somebody greet you and say, boy, it's good to see you, glad you're here. Anybody? Did, did I, I hope that happened to all of you. Should. If so, did it brighten your day just a little bit for somebody to smile and say, man, I'm glad to see you today. Hope that made you feel better. And it did when you got up before you had your cup of coffee this morning. It should have improved your day just a little bit to have somebody greet you and say, I'm glad to see you in God's house today. Or they ask about how you were doing. Was it a blessing? Well, maybe not a giant blessing, but was it a blessing? It God intended for it to be. That's why I said gather together. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. If somebody shook your hand this morning or hugged your neck, did it help? Was it a blessing? Sure it was. I, I'm looking at people I know and love out here. 
I mean, one lady's been hiding behind a mask all morning long, sitting out here in a wheelchair, thinking she doesn't know I'm, that I know that's Mary Jane. <laughs> Mary Jane, I'm glad to see you. I love you. We all love Mary Jane. Yeah, they all are applauding because you know that's true. Now, see, somebody that don't know Mary Jane, Jane know that she has two roles. That, well, she's had a lot of roles in the, over the years, but she's had two primary roles that she's been famous for. One is she would give out bags of information about our church to visitors. So we've always called Mary Jane our bag lady. <laughs> the other thing is, and I don't, I don't think this is scriptural, Mary Jane, but she delights in kissing bald-headed men on top of their bald heads. She left you do it this morning. And Daryl let her do it. Uh, so if y'all have not experienced that, I don't know what to tell you. But didn't it feel good? Didn't it feel good just to applaud the fact that Mary Jane's back with us? She hadn't been able to be with us in quite some time due to health reasons. But God brought you back today. And we're so... Amen. That's what church is all about. That's why we don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We hear God answered your prayers. Thank you. We get to worship and praise God together. Oh my. Let me ask you, when you sang those songs a while ago, and you were singing them, uh, you, you, were, you were praising the Lord. Did you feel better than you did yesterday when you weren't praising Him? Sure you did. You'd have, you'd have to be lying to me to say otherwise because I watched you. I listened to you. I'm up here. Yes, you were enjoying worshiping the Lord. That's why God says, don't forsake the assembling yourselves together. I designed you to do that. When you prayed and you listened to somebody else pray and you say, oh, that's, that's, that's what I needed to hear. That, they're praying for me. Was that a blessing to you? Has the Word of God helped you this morning, son? Listen, if the answer to any of that is yes, here's a whole complex set of instructions. Come back tonight. <laughs> yeah, come back tonight. Brother David's going to be preaching the Word of God. We're going to be singing praises to God like we did this morning. And there's going to be love flowing in this building just like it has been this morning and like it always is. Some people say, when the, I've, I've heard it said, when I walked into the building, I felt the presence of God. Others said, before I left, I felt the presence of God. He spoke to my heart. He blessed my life. That's why we don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We come to church because we need it. And God uses this to bless us. So when you come back tonight, bring somebody with you and you'll both be blessed. Okay, I'm going to wrap it up. We need the Lord. Oh. If we really want to experience the presence and power of God, remember the Holy of Holies, the holiest place. Remember the veil. Remember Jesus. And you come to God through Jesus, the only way. If you've never come to God through Jesus, you have not come to God. You've just talked about it, thought about it. And I want to encourage you to come to God through Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord today by receiving Him and trusting Him completely. And the second thing he says, trust him in tough times. <laughs> yeah, you trust him to save you, but trust him in tough times like right now. The third thing is to focus on others, <laughs> not just on yourselves. And then come to church as often as you possibly can and enjoy the blessings of it. And while you're here, encourage somebody else. Do, do, do any of you need that? And we need God, but any of you need that list that we just looked at? You say, you know what? I, I think I need to come to God through Jesus today because I never really have tried it that way. I've tried other stuff. But I didn't come to God through Jesus as my Savior and my Lord. The only way. We're going to give you an invitation to do that right now. Here's your chance. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Let's pray. Oh, dear Father. Oh, thank you for loving us the way that you do. Thank you for your dear son, Jesus. For it, Was it not for him, we could not approach you. You are eternally 100% holy. And none of us are. Father, for the person that's here today who's never been saved, they, they have never been born again. They've never had their sins forgiven, even though they may have said, God, forgive me. 
Father, today, right now, I pray that you'll reveal to them their great need for Jesus, your Son, as their Savior and Lord. And may they reach out to Him in faith, saying, Dear Jesus, forgive me and save me. Right now, I give myself over to you. Change me however you see fit. I want to spend eternity with you in heaven. And Father, for others that have been struggling with the troubles and trials that we've been going through, encourage them today. Encourage them. That we might be obedient to you and we might encourage others. And they might see what a difference you can make in our lives and in theirs. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.